Uh, I think we can now move on to the final contributor talk before the final session. So this is, okay, perfect. David, David Schmidt from the University of Gdansk. This is again about causal inferential theories. Okay, that is a bit different from the website, but uh, it's, it's simplified, so please. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks, and so thanks to the organizers for bringing us all together, and thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to tell you about this uh, ambitious research project that I've been working on with my collaborators, John Selby and Rob Speckens, which you can find on the archive. So in, in a single slide, what I'm gonna tell you about here is an approach towards constructing a new, more compelling realist interpretation for quantum theory. So this is a, a new kind of realist interpretation insofar as it goes beyond the standard ontological models framework, which is kind of the usual notion of realism. Um, but it's still going to be a framework that allows us to provide causal explanations of what's going on in the world. And it's gonna be constructed to respect the spirit of locality and of non-contextuality. So let me start by a quote by uh, James, who said it best when he said, our present quantum mechanical formalism is a peculiar mixture describing in part realities of nature, in part incomplete human information about nature, all scrambled up by Heisenberg and Bohr into an omelet that nobody has seen how to unscramble. Yet we think that the unscrambling is a prerequisite for any further advance in basic physical theory. For if we cannot separate the subjective and objective aspects of the formalism, we cannot know what we are talking about. It is just that simple. Now, in our point of view, the best way to describe the realities of nature is in a theory of causation. And the best way to reason in the face of incomplete human information is to use a theory of inference. And then if we want to achieve some kind of unscrambling of causation and inference, then we need some kind of framework that talks about how these two um, components interact uh, and um, that's gonna be this causal inferential framework that I'm introducing here. Now, even in a classical world, it can be tricky to unscramble causation and inference. So if I take some data on say two classical random variables and I see a, a lot of correlation in this data, can I deduce that there's a causal influence from one on the other, or can I merely make statistical inferences on the basis of this correlation? Well, this is a question that statisticians have wrestled with for decades, even centuries, um, but in, the last few decades, we've made a lot of progress on this question using the framework of classical causal models, which lets us answer these questions um, both conceptually and also uh, quantitatively and in practice. Um, so this framework of classical causal models was kind of a great success um, at unscrambling causation and inference, but it runs into trouble in a quantum world. As soon as you start imagining experiments like this one, where you have some pair of uh, particles which are generated in some entangled state, and then you do measurements on each half of them. And this is exactly the sort of experiment that Bell considered. And Bell's theorem can be kind of posed as a conjunction of two assumptions. So first he assumed that the essential causal structure of interest uh, is, is this one here. We have two systems, L and L prime, which are prepared in some generically correlated state. And then there's some local measurement performed on each half of the, these states. Uh, and um, so there's some local setting variables and some classical outcomes. And we look at the correlations on these classical variables. So, so first he assumed this causal structure, but then secondly, he assumed that the way you describe this scenario is within the framework of classical causal models or equivalently the framework of ontological models where each of these quantum systems is associated to some ontic state space or if, if you like just a classical random variable. And this is, sort of the standard way of encoding classical realism, saying that systems have properties and these properties mediate correlations. So if you take the conjunction of these two assumptions, you can derive Bell inequalities. That's what Bell did. And he realized that quantum theory violated these inequalities. And the question is, well, what do we do in light of these quantum violations? Do we give up on this assumption? Do we give up on this assumption? Well, let's consider each in turn. First, we could consider a radical causal structure. So for example, we could allow that uh, this local setting has a causal influence on this local outcome, or we could imagine that the preparation of these two systems is simultaneously uh, determining which setting variable will be chosen by one of the parties. So these are the superluminal and super deterministic explanations respectively. And there's a lot of problems with any sort such explanations. Um, the superluminal signaling is in clear tension with relativity theory. Super determinism is in clear tension with the idea that experimentalists can freely choose um, setting variables. 
And both of these sorts of assumptions violate uh, natural assumptions that are um, typically made within the framework of classical causal models, like the no fine tuning assumption. So we're going to assume, we're gonna stick with the conservative causal structure and take this to be the actual causal structure in a Bell scenario, which means that we're gonna be forced to consider an, a new kind of realism. So we don't, we don't wanna give up on realism entirely. We want some generalized notion of realism. And there's kind of a long history of approaches which consider radical forms of realism. We've got the many worlds approach, consistent histories. You could probably put cubism and relational quantum mechanics in this camp. Um, and our framework is also gonna be essentially motivated by considering a new kind of realism. Now, of course, once you start to go radical with your notion of realism, it's a, it's a dangerous game to play. You don't want to have no constraints whatsoever, or you might end up with some uh, kind of absurd ontology or some kind of uh, uh, inability to give causal explanations or, or something like that. So we want some constraints on non-classical realist approaches. And I've already mentioned one of these constraints, which I think most interpretative programs subscribe to. They agree that these approaches should uh, satisfy various forms of locality. But the two principles, uh, the two further principles that our approach is also going to be guided by, which distinguishes our approach from these other approaches, is uh, the principle of non-contextuality and the idea that we should ultimately be uh, providing good classical, uh, sorry, good causal explanations of what's going on in the world. And to do so, of course, we need to unscramble causal and inferential um, elements of the theory. So this brings us to the framework itself, the framework of causal inferential theories. A theory in this framework is gonna be constructed out of two subtheories, a causal subtheory and an inferential subtheory. And then it's gonna be built as a particular, following a particular mathematical construction that involves these two subtheories. And of course, I'm not gonna have time to go into this particular mathematical construction here. I'm just gonna give you the, the overall flavor. Formally, each of these three objects here is a process theory. And these are maps between process theories. So the causal subtheory is meant to describe the realities of nature, as James put it, things that are existing in the world and, and uh, happening to, to systems out there in the world. The inferential subtheory is describing the way that an agent reasons in the face of their incomplete information. So the, to say a bit more about the causal subtheory, it's uh, it's describing physical degrees of freedom, which are causal mediaries. So they have properties and these properties influence one another. And the way that they influence one another is described by the processes in this theory. So things uh, like this process here, which has some inputs and some outputs, it's, it's describing a causal mechanism out there in the world. And note that I'm drawing all these processes running vertically here. In contrast, I'm gonna draw uh, diagrams in the inferential theory running horizontally. So you can tell immediately at a glance whether a particular diagram is representing something that's happening out in the world or something that someone's reasoning about. So in the inferential theory, we have the systems that are being reasoned about. We have states of knowledge on those systems, updating of those states of knowledge, and then asking logical propositions about those, about what is known. And then uh, we construct the full causal inferential theory out of these two components. So naturally, they're going to have to interact. So here we see an example where we have some inferential wire interacting with some, some causal wires. And this kind of diagram is going to be useful for describing what one knows about what's happening to some system. So let me say a bit more about that. And this is, in some sense, one of the kind of key changes in our framework. Uh, in, in many physical theories, the fundamental object of study is the dynamics or the, the causal mechanisms. So here we see a causal mechanism T that transforms the system A in some way into some other system B. And in our framework, the fundamental object that we're going to study is not this sort of object, but rather a state of knowledge that some agent has about a causal mechanism. And that's depicted in this diagram here. So to put it into words, this diagram depicts the dynamics of some system is described by a process T. Whereas this diagram says, my state of knowledge about the dynamics mapping A into B is described by some probability distribution sigma over the set of dynamics that could possibly transform A into B. And uh, to give you some idea why this is a useful and, and necessary thing to do, um, let's, let's consider how this helps us unscramble causation and inference. And I'll do this with just a simple example. So consider a bit, a classical bit that's existing in the world. There's some dynamics on it. 
And we want to uh, consider the four possible, uh, the, the space of possible functional dynamics on a bit has the identity function, the not function, the reset to zero function, and the reset to one function. And note that the first two of these have complete causal connection. Uh, the output is completely determined by the input, whereas the last two have complete causal disconnection. The output is not uh, a function of the input at all. And now consider two different states of knowledge about the functional dynamics. So imagine there's an agent who knows that uh, whatever dynamics is happening on this bit, it's, it's definitely one of these two causally connected cases, but he's not sure which. And in fact, he assigns probability one half to each of those possibilities. But there's a second agent in some other circumstance who has a different state of knowledge. He knows for sure that uh, it, what's really happening is one of these causally disconnected processes. And again, he assigns equal probability to either of the possibilities. So these are clearly referring to two distinct uh, happenings in the world. Here, here uh, this state of knowledge refers only to causally uh, connected dynamics, and this state of knowledge refers only to the causally disconnected dynamics. So these, these two states of affairs couldn't possibly be more different. Um, but if you think about it, these two states of knowledge lead these agents to make exactly the same predictions about the outputs uh, of this dynamics, given any information about the inputs of the dynamics. In other words, they're inferentially equivalent states of knowledge. They lead you to make all the same inferences. And you can kind of figure this out pretty simply if you write down the stochastic map associated with either of these dynamics. The stochastic map is this one here, which is a completely randomizing map. And it follows from this that in a sort of standard ontological representation of these two situations, uh, the, the standard representation would be as a, a stochastic map, namely this stochastic map. And in a generalized probabilistic theory, again, uh, th these theories only represent sort of inferential equivalence classes. So again, you'd represent these processes just by this kind of process. In other words, they'd have exactly the same representation. So in both of these standard frameworks for ontological theories and for operational theories, the, this dramatic distinction between complete causal connection and complete causal disconnection is totally lost. You just can't uh, describe that distinction within these standard frameworks. But in our approach, the fundamental object is gonna be this state of knowledge or this state of knowledge. And of course, by looking at the state of knowledge, you can deduce whether it's the causally connected case or the disconnected case. So this is a simple uh, example of how we are able to retain more information about the distinction between causation and inference than usual frameworks. Okay, so now let me introduce to you some specific examples of causal inferential theories. I'll introduce two kinds of examples. The first is the classical realist theory. And you can think of this kind of like an ontological theory in the usual uh, framework, but now it's formally a causal inferential theory and there are some, some uh, conceptual differences. So this classical realist causal inferential theory is the one that you get when you take your inferential theory to be classical probability theory, namely Boolean logic and Bayesian inference. And you take your causal theory to be classical random variables as your systems and just functional dynamics over those as your uh, evolution. And if you take these two process theories and you combine them following the appropriate mathematical construction, then you build this uh, classical realist causal inferential theory. Operational causal inferential theories, in contrast, are what you get when you, again, use the classical theory of inference, but now your causal theory is a different one, namely one that's more operationally motivated, um, where systems are just abstract degrees of freedom, and the processes on these are laboratory procedures uh, envisioned as just lists of instructions for things you can do in the laboratory. And so, as I mentioned, all of these objects here are formally process theories. Um, but for now, all I want to say is uh, this classical realist causal inferential theory has a lot more structure than any of these operational theories. And that just follows from the fact that the process theory of functional dynamics has a lot of natural mathematical structure, like the composition of functions is just given by another function. Um, whereas the uh, process theory of laboratory procedures is a, a more nebulous concept that doesn't have as much mathematical structure. So for example, you can derive that there's a unique classical realist theory. Um, it in particular has a unique probability rule, whereas these operational theories can have different probability rules. Uh, so this is really kind of a, a class of causal inferential theories here. 
So now that we've introduced the operational causal inferential theories and the classical realist causal inferential theories, the natural next question is, can you find a mapping from your operational to your classical realist theories? And uh, if so, you might hope that this mapping would then allow you to give a kind of classical realist explanation for what's going on with your operational data in your operational theory. Of course, this mapping needs to satisfy certain properties, like that the causal structure is preserved and the empirical predictions in the operational theory are reproduced. If you can find such a mapping, then it makes sense to say you have a, an explanation of what's going on. We'll call this kind of map a classical realist representation. And this is exactly the sort of question that Bell was asking. He said, here's my quantum circuit. Can I find a classical circuit of the same form, which can reproduce the same statistics? And he showed that, no, in fact, there's no such mapping for this particular causal structure. Now, even if you can find such a map for a given causal structure, it's been argued in a lot of work in the last 10 or 15 years that this isn't on its own a compelling explanation of the operational data unless it satisfies a further principle, namely the principle of generalized non-contextuality. And in our more recent work, the paper I'm talking about here, we actually showed that this principle of generalized non-contextuality is an instance of a deeper principle, which we called Leibnizianity. So a classical realist representation is Leibnizian if and only if inferentially equivalent processes in the operational theory are mapped to inferentially equivalent processes in the classical realist theory. So it preserves inferential equivalence classes. And th so this lets us compare Bell-like and non-contextuality-like no-go theorems on a kind of equal footing. Bell-like no-go theorems say there is no classical realist representation that preserves the causal structure. And non-contextuality-like no-go theorems say there's no classical realist representation that preserves the causal structure and preserves inferential equivalences. So you can see that uh, Leibnizianity uh, or non-contextuality assume more than um, Bell-like no-go theorems which is why we can prove no, this sort of no-go theorem in a much broader class of causal structures. But more interestingly, this now presents a kind of natural way out of these no-go theorems. And that is, those no-go theorems are formulated in terms of classical realist representations. So what if we ask for some generalized notion of, uh, uh, of a representation, like a non-classical realist representation? Um, to tell you what I have in mind here, I need to introduce a new class of causal inferential theory, uh, which I'll call non-classical realist causal inferential theories. Just, and just being is... cautious of time, yeah? So I Perfect. don't know if you yep. have a lot more to say. No, no, I'm good. Uh, so um, this theory here is a uh, should be viewed as a generalization of the classical realist causal inferential theory. And it's one that you get in the natural way by taking your classical theory of inference and generalizing it. So now we have a non-classical theory of inference. And instead of describing the, the causal theory in uh, using the classical, um, for, uh, the classical causal theory, we have now a non-classical theory of causation. And we're gonna take these two and we're gonna combine them following this mathematical prescription to get our non-classical realist causal inferential theory. Um, and just to be clear, we don't yet have concrete proposals for any of these three process theories, but uh, we have some constraints on what they have to look like. And in particular, if this is to be a good realist theory that provides good causal explanations and so on, then it has to have certain features, which I don't have time to tell you about here, but um, essentially uh, we can look at what is it about this classical realist causal inferential theory that makes it such a compelling notion of realism. And uh, we, we distill out the key features that make uh, this theory, um, a, a good notion of a, a good realist theory, and we demand that uh, this generalization thereof has analogous features. So we talk more about this in our paper. So to put it all on one uh, essentially final slide, our goal is to find a non-classical realist causal inferential theory where there exists a representation of operational quantum theory within that non-classical realist theory where furthermore, this mapping has to preserve the causal structure and preserve inferential equivalences. And if we were to achieve all this, then we would have achieved an unscrambling sort of by construction of this causal inferential theory. It has uh, unscrambled the ontological and the epistemic components of, uh, uh, of the theory. And if it satisfies this desiderata, then it respects locality. And if it satisfies this desiderata, then it respects the principles of Leibnizianity and non-contextuality. And 
So this then would be our uh, more compelling um, interpretation for quantum theory, where ultimately we would have taken quantum theory, understood it in a particular way, which pulls out these epistemic ingredients that ultimately we're not that interested in, and the fundamental quantum ontology, which really is you know, the holy grail. It's the thing that we're, we're really fundamentally after. Um, and quantum theory then would be seen as a particular synthesis of these epistemic ingredients and this fundamental ontology. So that's all that I have time to say, but uh, thanks for your attention. And um, if we don't have time for questions, please feel free to shoot me any questions or comments you have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please. All right, so yeah, no, come on, let's, uh, let's see if there's any quick question. Yes, Emily, please. Yes, uh, so I'm very uh, sympathetic to the project of trying to unscramble inferential structure from modal structure, but I'm very skeptical that modal stru structure has got to be specifically causal structure, um, because there doesn't seem to be much evidence that asymmetrical causal relations are genuinely fundamental. Um, and I will also dispute that realism is synonymous with causal. Um, how would you feel about a generalization of this approach to, that replaces causal structure with some kind of more general objective modal structure? Yeah, that's a good question. I've kind of um, glossed over the fact that here I'm essentially using the term realist and uh, realist theory and sort of a, a theory that provides causal explanation as synonymous. And I think that's not a not always what people mean by realist. There's many different notions of realism. So um, as for how I would feel about uh, the sort of counter proposal you made, um, I guess I'd have to hear more details. And in fairness, I haven't presented my motivations here for why I take a causal explanation to be fundamental to, to realism. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, that's maybe a, a longer conversation but I think it's one that needs to be had. Thanks. I think, yeah, let's, a quick question, Farid, and then we move into the break. Uh, hi, Dave. hi, David. Uh, that was very, a very nice talk. Thank you so much. Uh, so what I wanted to ask is, um, uh, doesn't this, this uh, 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 separation between causal and inferential part of your uh, formalism introduce a, a problem of a cut between, uh, like like Heisenberg cut, between between the two parts. Like, uh, how how do you deal with uh, with that? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. It it absolutely introduces a kind of cut which is analogous to the Heisenberg cut, um, and also analogous to the Heisenberg cut, which uh, it's a movable cut, so you can. Um, it, with the Heisenberg cut, you can decide exactly which parts of the world you want to model classically and which parts quantumly. And you can kind of always uh, add more of the classical description into the, the part of the world that you want to describe quantumly. So similarly here, we have to decide which parts of the world do we want to describe uh, the full dynamical evolution of and which bits do we think it's sufficient to um, just model what an agent is reasoning about them. So for example, if, uh, if an agent has a correlated state of knowledge about two systems, you might want to ask, well, where did they get that? Uh, why is it sensible for them to have this correlated state of knowledge? Surely that just means there was ultimately some dynamical system that influenced whether the state of the system was the first state or the second state, and the agent then had uncertainty about that earlier system. So you can, you can kind of move the cut by taking this uh, state of knowledge that an agent has and turning it into uh, uncertainty about some classical common cause, which now is an actual uh, dynamical process in the world. So I don't think this um, is necessarily a problem insofar as uh, they're just two different but consistent explanations of the same scenario. But I think as with the Heisenberg cut, when you start looking at complicated enough scenarios like Wigner's friend kind of scenarios, um, there's definitely potential for, for problems. So I think thinking about the nature of this causal inferential cut in our framework is definitely a, a question worth thinking about more. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. And let me thank all the speakers of the workshop so far with a nice round of applause. Uh, we have a short break now, but please do not disappear. And we will reconvene at half past four. There's a panel discussion. So if uh, we will have a couple of questions that we can ask the panelists from the organizing team, but we would be very um, appreciative to get questions from the audience, so prepare some.
I don't know, uh, interesting queries for our panelists and to generate a nice discussion in the final hour of the workshop. So see you soon.